Welcome to tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew, and today is Thursday, July 23rd, 2015, and here's a look at what's coming up. Tonight. There is a criminal element. It screams to them, come to our town, USA. We'll protect you from our terrible policemen. We'll protect you from these tough American laws. As a mother pleads for border security, a smuggling operation is caught on camera. As you can see, we're sitting on the side of the border right here, the Rio Grande Valley, or the Rio Grande River, I should say, in Laredo, Texas. There are people coming over in rafts across the border over to the U.S. side. This is actually happening right now. We just saw this. We just caught these guys coming across the border. They're jumping in. They just jumped in the rafts. They're coming up one, two, three, four. They have big satchels. And then the dummies that will dumb enough to use. Last night while I was putting my children to bed, I received three frantic texts from Joe Biggs. Uh, one of them even had a 911 in it, call immediately. And I called him to find out what was going on because I knew he was going to Laredo to cover the Trump visit. And he started to go into this story of how they were down by the river. They saw men actually crossing the river and then loading drugs into a car. If you haven't seen the footage yet, it's on our YouTube channel, the Alex Jones channel. And in an article from Paul Joseph Watson, the title of which is Caught on Camera, Illegal Smuggling Drugs into Laredo Before Trump Visit. And let me just tell you, what this video depicts is just a microcosm of the problem. What is going on in our country? Our border is wide open. Illegals, both nice and bad, are coming into our country. And a lot of bad ones are, and I'm going to get to the stats in a bit. But first, I want to roll the footage of what our reporters, Josh Owens and Joe Biggs, shot last night in Laredo, Texas. As you can see, we're sitting on the side of the border right here, the Rio Grande Valley, or the Rio Grande River, I should say, in Laredo, Texas. There are people coming over in rafts across the border over to the U.S. side. This is actually happening right now. We just saw this cameraman, Joshua Owen, saw it over my shoulder as we were just reporting on Donald Trump coming in to talk about the unsecured border. This is breaking news. Right here, InfoWars catches it. All right, I'm getting it, I'm getting it, I'm getting it. Don't put your hand up. We just caught these guys coming across the border. They're jumping in, they just jumped in the rafts. They're coming up one, two, three, four. They have big satchels. And they're driving away in this. That was a red uh, Ford Explorer, right? Yeah. Now, if you think that's the only time that drugs come across our border, you're sadly mistaken. And I'm going to get to the statistics about that and the amount of criminals that come across the border in addition to the drugs. But Donald Trump is receiving a lot of flack for what he said about illegal immigration and why he wants to build a wall at the border. But let's look at what he actually said. Here's his quotes. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and I assume are good people. And some, I assume, are good people, he said. And he's right. There are some illegal immigrants that come to this country that aren't bad, even though they're doing it the wrong way and not coming in through the proper channels. But a lot of them are bad. Now let's take a look at the drugs that come into this country through Mexico. Mexican drug cartels make up to $29 billion annually from U.S. drug sales, with 90% of the cocaine that enters America tran transiting through Mexico. The majority of marijuana, methamphetamine that are sold in the U.S. also come from Mexico. $29 billion. Now, let's just look at pot. They're starting to legalize it in some states. Uh, Colorado, for instance, last year, in their fiscal year, they made $53 billion in tax revenue from marijuana alone. That's just in marijuana sales. Now, multiply that times 50, 
and you're going to get a number of 2.6 billion in potential tax revenue to the United States. And if you add also the tax money that's going to house nonviolent criminals of who are selling marijuana or buying marijuana or caught using marijuana, you're going to have untold billions in revenue in this country that we could spend on a, a whole host of other things. And then you can make the argument, well, should we legalize all drugs? And that's an argument that you can make in, at any time, because anytime you have prohibition, it creates a black market and people are still going to buy this stuff. And now I want to look at the crimes that are happening just in the state of Texas with illegal aliens. This is just the last few years. PJ Media has this exclusive. This is an unreleased internal report from the Texas Department of Public Safety. They say illegal aliens committed 611,000 unique crimes, thousands of homicides and sexual assaults, and that of that, nearly 3,000 homicides. And that's the Texas Department of Public Safety's own statistics. Now take a look at this graph that they also included in there, and it shows the stats across the United States. Tucson and the Rio Grande Valley seem to be the hotbeds for criminal activity, but you could see other states and other areas in states, El Paso's listed there, Laredo, where we saw our footage from earlier today, uh, San Diego, Yuma, all these places, this is what's happening at the borders. This is where the criminals are coming in and they're doing crimes as soon as they get into this country and they're not being caught, they're not being prosecuted, and if they do get caught, they're not being deported. Now, Liam McAdoo has more. InfoWars caught shocking video of drugs being smuggled across the U.S.-Mexico border, validating highly criticized claims by Donald Trump that illegal immigrants are bringing drugs into the U.S. InfoWars reporters Joe Biggs and Josh Owens traveled to Laredo to cover Trump's highly publicized visit. While they were recording footage of the Rio Grande River, they spotted a group of illegals crossing the river on rafts. Moments later, we see one of the men nervously holding open the trunk of a red SUV, while four others frantically toss what is almost certainly drugs into the back of the car. Those men scurry back toward Mexico while the vehicle speeds off into the U.S. Mexican drug cartels make up to $29 billion annually from U.S. drug sales, and this footage shows just how easily that transaction happens due to the porous nature of the border. Now, while this footage may be shocking to some, it's not at all surprising. In Texas alone, foreign aliens committed more than 600,000 unique crimes from 2008 to 2014. But the president has plans for even more amnesty by expanding the number of illegal immigrants allowed to stay in the country, shielding 80 percent of the nation's illegals from deportation, and he has even threatened to veto a bill that would strip sanctuary cities of federal funding. The bill aims to deny cities that refuse to enforce federal immigration laws certain Justice Department grants. The bill is a response to the shooting death of 32-year-old Kate Steinle. Convicted felon Francisco Sanchez was an illegal immigrant who had already been deported multiple times, but he was free to murder because sanctuary city San Francisco is under no pressure to enforce federal laws. Listen to the heart-wrenching testimony of Laura Wilkerson, a mother whose son was murdered by an illegal immigrant. You're officially notified today there's a problem when this happens. You can't deny it any longer. You cannot stand by and ignore our families, our American families. You're elected by Americans, not any other country. You should be for Americans. I will not give up control uh, another one of my children so that a foreign person can have a nicer life. Sanctuary city policies scream to the criminal element of all of illegals in this country, there is a criminal element. It screams to them, come to our town, USA. We'll protect you from our terrible policemen. We'll protect you from these tough American laws. Can you imagine a parent having to go in front of Congress and just asking them to deport criminals? It's totally disgusting. Let's move on to some terrorism news. This is um, out of, from Kurt Nemo. MI5 British defense sources say ISIS will bomb football games with drones. That's right, they're going to start turning the tables on us. A counter-terror advisor to the British government has told the tabloid, the Daily Mirror, Islamic State terrorists plan to use drones and attacks on music festivals and football games. Uh, I guess in this country we call it soccer. Earlier this year, a U.S.-led coalition in Iraq claimed to have destroyed an ISIS drone near Fallujah, so they do have that technology. They don't have reusable attack drones, but I think it's just a matter of time before they jury-rig surveillance drones into flying IEDs. 
Basically, they could turn them into little kamikaze drones, said Christopher Harmer, a senior naval analyst. So that's what we have to look forward to. Now ISIS is turning the tables on us and using drones. But what's going on here in this country? In this country, we have the Snoop Society, where people who work for the government, in addition to doing their jobs, whether it's pushing papers or running the infrastructure, now they're becoming little Stasi agents. That's right. Here it is from Mark Slavlo. Seattle's nanny state is deputizing trash men as secret police to snoop through waste bins. In Seattle, where the city is now using trash collectors to snoop in trash cans to catch residents and businesses who are in non-compliance with the new requirements to compost materials that break down. That's right. If you throw an apple core, if you throw pineapple pieces into the garbage can, which normally most people do, not everybody composts, not everybody has a garden, even though that's a good idea, now Seattle wants to make it mandatory that you put these in compost bins. It gets better. Of course, fines will follow for Seattle residents after an educational period where violators will be issued written warnings for actions as simply as tossing an apple core. That's right. You're going to get an educational period first, and then the beatings will continue until morale approves. Which brings us to our next report from John Bound, talking about how President Obama and the minions and millions of minions behind him really loathe America and what it is and what it stands for. Has anybody from the administration contacted you? No. Nobody has contacted neither my parents nor I. Not we the White not House, not the president, not the vice president. We have not heard a word. Obama now has a proven track record of ignoring the tragedy associated with American lives due to his policies. When it comes to tragedy associated with division, President Obama is all over it. If a white male teen was involved in the same kind of scenario, that from top to bottom, uh, both the outcome uh, and the aftermath might have been different. Arms out to the side. Are you all, I don't have a weapon. Hey, get your, you can't do that. that. But when five Marines are killed on American soil by a radical jihadist domestic terrorist. Have you heard from the president? No. Does that surprise you? No. Or a beautiful young upstanding American woman is gunned down in broad daylight in San Francisco. Yeah, can I ask you if in the last three weeks, President Obama has expressed his condolences to you or your family? Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, when there have been other very public deaths in this country, um, like Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin and Freddie Gray, uh, the president has expressed his condolences to the family. I would have expected him to do that here. He did more than express his condolences in those cases. He had a lot to say about, um, about those circumstances, I think because they tied into policies that he cared about, like gun control and, and uh, uh, alleged police profiling. And um, uh, yet, uh, when one of his policies with respect to immigration enforcement is at, um, uh, at the root of a problem here uh, that we're all discussing today, we don't hear anything from him, and you didn't hear anything from him. And I, about the kindest thing I can say about that is that's incredibly disheartening and troubling to me. The Obama administration doesn't contact families or even lower the flags at the White House until people start complaining. Lapdog media spinster Chuck Todd of NBC's Meet the Press recently declared, It turns out there is no evidence to back up Trump's now famous claim that immigrants are rapists and bringing crime in the United States. In fact, we couldn't find a single study that links violent crime and immigration. Chuck Todd couldn't create a bigger lie even with Brian Williams helping him. Illegal immigrants accounted for nearly 37% of sentences in 2014, even though they only represent 3.5% of the U.S. population. Breitbart reports that even according to the United States' own criminal alien statistics, according to the United States Government Accountability Office, Illegal immigrants represented 16.8% of drug trafficking cases, 20% of kidnapping hostage taking, 74.1% of drug possession, 12.3% of money laundering, and 12% of murder convictions. There are many of the ICE agents that I deal with feel like they have, uh, they have been handcuffed by this administration recently 
Do you have that feeling also in the ICE agents that you work with? Absolutely, I do. The, the line level officers in both ICE and us have the same desire, and that's to keep the community safe. So they took an oath. They have a mission. They're not being allowed to carry out that mission. That that um, morale issue was discussed and addressed by the administration with the raise, um, but that, that is not what's giving the ICE officers at the line level poor morale. Can you pay a law enforcement officer enough to ignore crime? <laughs> no. We, we do it, we did it, I did it, or we do it for uh, other reasons. We do it because we feel like we make our community safer. We do it because we, we want to help people around us. We don't do it for uh, another $1,000 a year in, in pay. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's, as I said earlier, it's a calling. Uh, we don't choose law enforcement, it chooses us. Average American citizens are being lied to and ignored on an intolerable scale never before seen in the history of the United States. Impeach Obama. American lives depend on it. John Bound for Infowars.com. Welcome back to the Infowars Nightly News. These next two segments, this is going to be a two-part interview we're going to do with our next guest. You may remember terms like MK Ultra or the Kool-Aid Acid Test, even Psychedelic Rock. All these uh, words conjure up images from the 60s and 70s. But did the CIA and their involvement with LSD, did that ever leave us? And why are so many rock stars killed from drug overdoses. Our, uh, our next guest, author John Potash, thinks he has some of the answers to this. He's got a book out, Drugs as Weapons Against Us, the CIA's murderous targeting of SDS, Panthers, Hendrix, Lennon, Cobain, Tupac, and other activists. I'm joined now by the author. John, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, we've covered here a lot on InfoWars about how our country is one of the biggest drug runners, drug smuggling operations in the world. Why don't you go back, just give us a, a brief history of how the CIA got involved in this and the different operations that they've had over the world. Well, the CIA's operation, that, that's the framework for this book, it was Operation MKUltra, as you, as you mentioned before. But uh, other operations were before it, Bluebird and Artichoke and operations with names such as that. Previous to that, uh, the families that started the CIA, according to highest level CIA whistleblower, Victor Marchetti and a British magazine editor, Francis Stoner Saunders, in her book, The Cultural Cold War, um, they, they said that these top families that had originally gained their wealth through opium shipping uh, started the CIA in 1947 and made them directors of all the other 14 plus intelligence agencies. And uh, in doing that, they then started these operations, uh, particularly MKUltra, which became an umbrella operation for these uh, many other sub operations. And they had actually saved Nazi scientists who were already experimenting with psychedelics on concentration camp victims, brought them into, and that was through Operation Paperclip, they saved hundreds of uh, Nazi scientists. And uh, through Operation Sunshine, they sent thousands of Nazis down to Central, like Latin America, basically, to help with cocaine trafficking, they built cocaine trafficking networks down there. Now, with, with MK Ultra, they had these uh, scientists um, work with different psychedelics and experiment with really two dozen drugs, uh, using them on uh, about a thousand Edgewood Arsenal soldiers and doing studies on them and then expanding that to studies on prisoners and studies on hospital patients and then studies on unwitting uh, average citizens. Now, when Operation MKUltra went into effect, they said it was the use, the manual said it was the use of drugs as unconventional warfare. And I show the evidence that that's not just warfare in the battlefield, that's warfare on your average citizens, but particularly really activists, you know, activists that opposed the uh, CIA's agenda of endless wars and who, uh, you know, activists who, who are pr trying to work on civil rights. And these are some of the things that the CIA opposed. Now, when uh, the, the number one drug that started to be used by MKUltra was LSD, and I show the C uh, MKUltra manuals on, you know, LSD and the papers they had on L LSD. And what they did is what, what we found is the fact that they had uh, undercover agents um, such as Timothy Leary, who admitted working for the CIA at one point, um, he promoted LSD in a huge way and promoted the idea to turn on, tune in, and drop out. Yeah, I was going to say that. He came up with that term, and that got a lot of right. people into taking it and then going out to concerts and listening to it and having these 
out of uh, body, out of mind experiences. Exactly. And so I argue that was to drop out of all the activism that was building up in the 1960s. This Many people were getting involved in civil rights activism and many people were getting involved in the anti-war movement starting about 1964, 1965 and, and went into you know, later 60s, of course. Now, before that, though, they were targeting a number of particular activists, such as they had a, ABC News said that they had a psychedelic hit list. And these hit lists included different leaders of countries that, that we oppose, such as, you know, of course, um, Che Guevara and Castro, but also Nasser of Egypt. And so they were on a list of people to be targeted with LSD. And so another person I show the evidence of that was on that hit list was Paul Robeson, the uh, great singer and actor and civil rights activist. Paul Robeson Jr. gave many lectures saying that his father uh, received a drink from some agents when he was at the American embassy in Russia. A few weeks later, he was scheduled to uh, meet with Castro and Che Guevara and talk about civil rights in the United States. This was coming at a time when the U.S. was about to uh, have, you know, their Bay of Pigs, the invasion of, uh, of, of Cuba. And so uh, here, here is Paul Robeson, and he, he gets his drink dosed with a psychedelic. He doesn't know, what, doesn't know what's going on at that time. It's 1961. Most people didn't know much about LSD. And then when his son came out to find out what was going on, his son was an adult at this time, his son got dosed also. His drink got dosed with a, a super psychedelic. Um, they did it to Robeson a number of times. He thought he was losing his mind. They put him in the hospital. They convinced him that he needed to go into the, a mental health hospital. And then they convinced his wife that he deserved to get electroconvulsive shock treatment. And at that time, uh, they gave him super high doses of electroconvulsive shock treatment and really hurt his mind badly. And so after that, he felt like he, he didn't want to be remembered that way. And he wanted to be remembered for who he was before that, before they, they damaged his mind so much. So he became a recluse and he ended up dying in the early to mid uh, 1970s. You know, and this really gets to me because our main tagline, our slogan here at InfoWars is there's a war on for your mind. And if they can control your mind, mm -hmm. your body will follow, uh, everything right. else goes along with it. So that just seems really, uh, it's just an evil diabolical plan to go after people that you're opposed to diametrically because you're a group that's for war and for you know this endless military industrial complex. And when people speak out against it, you actually send people out to, to dose them. You're also in your book, you, you cover the, the Rolling Stones as well as another rock group. One of their members, I don't know, a lot of people may not even know right. this, Brian Jones was one of the founding members, was found uh, dead in, in his backyard in a pool, and they, they uh, called it Death by Misadventure. Uh, but you've right. got a couple stories in there about Brian Jones and Mick Jagger. Why don't you share those with us? Right. So Brian Jones was the founder of the Rolling Stones, as you said, and he was considered the best musician in the Rolling Stones. He was the most respected member of the Rolling Stones for, for his you know, guitar playing, but he, they say he could play any instrument he wanted to. And so he, was, uh, he became close friends with Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon because he was such a great musician. And so um, I showed the evidence that in 1965, uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway's longtime editor, A.E. Hotchner, had uh, come to, Hotchner says that, that he, the CIA sent La Robert Lashbrook, the assistant deputy director of MK Ultra, over to London, and he had several missions. One was to spread a uh, fund, a CIA front company's money, a human ecology fund, spread their money to different agencies in Britain to promote uh, psychedelic drugs, and then to have agents uh, put psychedelics in different musicians' hands. To per And I argue that was partly to get them to promote LSD, partly to manipulate them easier because the CIA document says one of the goals with LSD is, to, is that when they got people tripping, they were, it was more easy to manipulate them. Yes. And, um, and I say partly also to hurt their best thinking because uh, I show at least four studies that show that LSD hurts our best competence, best thinking, and uh, causes some mild cerebral damage. Um, hmm. So in, in that... Once they got, you know, now they, they particularly targeted these anti-war musicians. John Lennon said, we always were against the Vietnam War. And um, and so and Mick Jagger and, and Brian Jones were the most vocally against the Vietnam War. And so uh, the first person that gave Mick Jagger 
his first hit of acid was an undercover FBI agent named, uh, his, his name was Schneiderman, David Schneiderman. He later changed his name to David Jove, but it came out in uh, the London Daily Mail, the London Daily Newspaper, that he uh, admitted to his girlfriend that he was working for the FBI as well as MI6, and, and uh, the Daily Mail confirmed that. Um, so he was uh, obviously an extension and working for MK Ultra with Robert Lashbrook. Now, um, Jones got into drugs at that time, uh, around 65, 66, but then he sobered up due to legal problems, and as did Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger, after they gave him that hit of acid, after Schneider, Schneiderman gave him that hit of acid, the police came in and then arrested them. And so it made all the news, it promoted LSD, um, and at the same time put uh, Jagger and Keith Richards under legal authority's thumb. John, John, stay right there. We're going to come back sure. with more of this. Uh, we're going to go to break, and we're going to be right back with the rest of this interview. Sure. You're going to find out why the CIA likes to kill your rock stars out there, or at least manipulate them until they are worthless to them. It's, don't go away. It's the InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. This is our final segment and part two of our interview with author John Potash, who has the book, Drugs as Weapons Against Us. We're definitely going to be carrying this in the InfoWars store. The CIA's murderous targeting of SDS, Panthers, Hendrix, Lennon, Cobain, Tupac, and other activists. And we were picking up, or we were just finishing up with the story of Brian Jones and the Rolling Stones, and he ended up dying. Mick Jagger is still with us for, for better right. or for worse. And, um, but one of the more talented members, uh, some say the most talented member yeah. of the Rolling Stones is not with us anymore. John, finish up your story right. with Brian Jones. So, yeah, so they were all under legal authority's thumb at that point. Brian Jones was not allowed out of the country when the Rolling Stones wanted to do the 1969 American tour. And so not being allowed out of the country, the Stones had to separate with him temporarily. But Jones ended up deciding he was going to call Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon, his friends, and ask them if they wanted to form a supergroup. He did. They, they tentatively said, yeah, they're, they're into it. And at that point, uh, Jones was sobering up, and uh, according to all accounts by an A.E. Hotchner's book, and uh, a guy, Nick Fitzgerald, who was a member of the Guinness family, was a close friend of Brian Jones, and he was at Jones's house. Jones sent him to town to pick up a friend when he came back from town. He said he couldn't get into Jones's house. They had, uh, cars were blocking off the driveway. He went around the back, and he saw his friend Brian Jones being drowned by several people. Um, he didn't know who, who it was at first because he just saw it from afar, but then someone popped out of the bushes and said, get out of here, Fitzgerald, or you'll be next. And Fitzgerald said he was scared to death to talk about it until years later when he wrote a memoir saying that he witnessed his friend Brian Jones getting drowned in his own swimming pool. And so... I show. I argue that this was a pattern of, you know, of course, Brian Jones died at 27. There's a lot of other rock musicians did. Janis Joplin died at 27. Jimi Hendrix died at 27. And that appears to be some kind of threat timing tactic. But the key is that all these musicians started getting, started trying to sober up, getting more into activism, being more anti-Vietnam War and more into the civil rights type of activism. And then they were killed for doing that. Um, after they were first manipulated to promote some of these drugs. Sure, and and let's go. Let's let's pick pick finish up here with Jimi Hendrix and John Lennon. You have an interesting mm -hmm. story about the way John Lennon was dosed with LSD, and it was uh, through George Harrison's dentist. Yeah. So you know, again, in 1965, you got Robert Lashbrook there uh, as the assistant deputy of CIA's MK Ultra, giving out the LSD, having agents get into uh, people's hands. And, and so you have the strange circumstance of John Lennon going to a dinner party with his friend George Harrison to uh, George Harrison's dentist's house. They uh, are about to leave for a party uh, I mean, for their friends playing in a band. And George Harrison's dentist says, no, you can't leave yet. You have to have our dessert and coffee. It's, we got the great, greatest coffee. They drink the coffee. Uh, and then they say, oh, well, you can't drive now because you, you just had LSD. And John Lennon was furious. Why did you do that? What's going on here? And George Harrison said, what's LSD? He didn't even know what it was at that point in time because it, it wasn't very well known in Britain. And uh, so that's the way that John Lennon got his first hit of acid and George Harrison got his first hit of acid. And I argue that um, people you know, around, so many agents and so many other people ended up convincing John Lennon and George Harrison that it wasn't so bad and you should keep tripping. And so they did. George Harrison then quit, quit for good in 1967. But John Lennon was convinced to do it a little bit longer. 
And in, in doing that, they ended up, you know, of course, promoting LSD. But when John Lennon started to sober up, um, you know, as he, he, he became a little bit of a recluse in the 1970s, um, and he was sobered up and came out with his two albums in 1980 and said he was going to march with some uh, workers who were protesting uh, certain their, for their rights. Uh, he was killed. And an attorney named Fenton Bressler, who was also a, a British um, crime reporter, he investigated it for about seven years or eight years. And he came out with the conclusion in his book, Who Killed John Lennon, that the CIA actually killed John Lennon and, and they uh, kind of... Uh, conditioned Mark Chapman to carry out the killing and had a backup shooter at the same time. Yeah, and and uh, if you look at what John Lennon was saying at the time, he wasn't buying the overpopulation myth. He wasn't buying peak oil. He was seeing through what the New World Order was putting out there as this is the way we're going to control human populations. We're going to control them through food, through resources. And he was saying, no, that's bunk. We can mm -hmm. actually, we can solve our problems. We can make this stuff better. Now, Jimi Hendrix was a guy who was actually, he was a soldier. Um, he, mm -hmm. he'd have, he, he didn't become against the Vietnam War until, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle of his career. But when he started speaking out, people were really listening. He came out with that, that great song, Machine Gun, and, and a, a, mm -hmm. a live album that he produced. And he was somebody that the, they shut up really quickly. Right. Yeah, Jimi Hendrix first got big in Britain, not in the United States. And he got so big so fast that he couldn't handle his own you know, touring and concerts. And in, into his life came a guy named Mike Jeffrey. Mike Jeffrey said he was former MI6, and you know, of course MI6 is British CIA. And all evidence points to the fact that he never really left MI6. He was still, still doing undercover work. And he began to sabotage Jimi Hendrix's uh, work in trying to get more into activism. MLK, I'm sorry, when, uh, Jimi Hendrix got very active when MLK died. Uh, that got him into supporting the Black Panthers. He dedicated his last album to Black Panthers. He started speaking out against the Vietnam War at that time. Um, and he started trying to form new movements against the Vietnam War. He was going to call Bob Dylan and ask him to be part, be part of his new activist project, according to his uh, fiance Monica Daneman, in her memoir. And Monica Daneman says that uh, Jeffrey tried to sabotage that. He first... Uh, Hendrix believes Jeffrey first planted drugs on him at the airport, and then she believes that he uh, that he gave him a super psychedelic before one of his anti-war benefit concerts, which caused him to stop his set early, um, you know, because he felt like he couldn't play as well as he wanted to. And so he he find, he was very upset with Mike Jeffrey, and he finally fired Mike Jeffrey. And within 48 hours of firing Mike Jeffrey, uh, he died, Jimi Hendrix. And afterwards, Mike Jeffrey actually admitted to a roadie that he had Hendrix killed. And uh, that was uh, James Tappy Wright, who came up with a memoir for the last few years. So it's uh, it seems to be it fit the pattern of an extension of you know, U.S. and British intelligence targeting. Right. You know. And this didn't end in the '60s. You've got stories in here um, about Kurt Cobain and Tupac Shakur. Uh, you know, yeah. let's finish up with those. We got about three minutes left, and sure. um, and then we'll let people know where they can get the book. Yeah. Kurt Cobain was also a, a serious uh, anti-war activist himself. He was uh, into a lot of different causes. And um, I show the evidence that he was psychologically profiled at a time when John Stockwell said that uh, his, the CIA asked, which John Stockwell was a CIA station chief who was a whistleblower. And he told me at a conference that um, the CIA, he, he personally flew in drugs for the CIA from the Vietnam er area they call it the Golden Triangle, and he also knew that the CIA was using its assets in the Golden Crescent area near Afghanistan up through the 80s up until 1990, and then of course you know further on. But in order to uh, have demand uh, su demand match supply of all that uh, opium and heroin coming in, they had to do the same thing they did in the 60s in terms of psychologically profiling which musicians could help them promote the heroin. And I argue they found uh, Kurt Cobain to match that because he had a susceptibility to heroin use because of a chronic stomach problem. And if you and, look now, heroin is one of the biggest drugs in America. It's it's sur yeah. supplanting everything. There's so cuz it's so cheap. Cuz we're getting it from Afghanistan yeah. now with uh with the convenient war over there. Um right. finish up, give me a, about so, a minute on Tupac and yeah. um because we know how Cobain ended up uh, getting it. Yeah. He supposedly and, shot himself with a shotgun. Yeah, and a good movie called Soaked in Bleach shows that he was actually murdered. And I argue, I show the evidence that a CIA acid actually uh, aided that murder. Mm -hmm. But with Tupac Shakur, he was a lifelong activist because his, his parents were the leading New York Black Panthers. 
And Tupac was just misunderstood because he only pretended to be a gangster in order to appeal to gangs and politicize them, which was part of his Black Panther family's uh, movement to, that got the Bloods and Crips to call peace truces in Los Angeles and that spread throughout the country and turned them into activism. But Tupac was actually head of a group called the New African Panthers when he was only 17 years old. He was active in eight cities nationwide. And uh, so the, uh, the U.S. intelligence already had his sights on Tupac the same way they did um, his parents because whistleblowers, uh, CIA, uh, FBI whistleblowers had said that they continued the FBI's counterintelligence program that targeted the Black Panthers up until at least the late 90s. Um, but they used to use different names for the, per for the tactics and the programs. Got it. Well, you can, we, it took us 20 minutes and we barely scratched the surface. The book is Drugs as Weapons Against Us. Uh, we're going to be carrying it in the InfoWars store. I don't think it's up yet, but I, I imagine by the next day or so, it'll be up in our store. So I encourage you to get a copy. John, where else can they find this book? Uh, you can also find it on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble or Books A Million. Um, Barnes & Noble, if they don't have it in the store, they say they can get it in the store within two or three days. But um, you can also uh, get it if you want a signed copy, you can get it from me at johnpodash.com. All right. Well, thanks. thanks for joining us. And if thanks you're so watching, much, if, you know, it's just one way that the government is basically using the, the drug culture to weaponize ourselves. They weaponize the leaders of our so-called cultural movements, the musicians out there. Uh, that is why you got musicians acting crazy, acting weird. And, you know, I wish we had more time, but I'm sure we're going to have you back on and we can get into more of this. Pick up the book. And if you're watching this, please, on YouTube, please consider becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. It's your subscription that helps pay for everything you see here. And we do thank our subscribers, PrisonPlanet.tv. That's our show. See us here tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central. It's the InfoWars Nightly News. Thanks for watching.